Welcome to our fermentation masterclass. My name is Kelly Donati and I'm the course coordinator and lecturer of the Masters of Food Systems and Gastronomy and the Bachelor of Food Studies. And I'm very excited to have with me today Sharon Flynn from The Fermentary, uh, CEO, founder and fermenter in chief. So today we'll be making three ferments, red cabbage ferment with fennel and orange, a brined bean ferment, and also a brined uh, Jerusalem artichoke. Thanks for having me. It's always Thanks so for coming, fun. Sharon. Um, we're going to attempt to clearly explain fermentation in 20 minutes, and I think we can. I think yep. we can do yeah. it. Yeah. So I'm the reason we chose um, these three ferments is because I think uh, they're the simplest. First, we're going to use salt to elicit some of the juices from within the cabbage and keep that juice to help with the ferment. And the next one is we're going to add salt to water and use that to retain the pH uh, while it lowers so we don't get any molds. And then it gives a chance for the sugars to come out and start fermenting. So when we talk about lowering pH, we're talking mm. about increasing acidity. Yes, that's right. Um, so at the fermentary, we're super passionate and staunch supporters of doing things naturally. So we like the, to rely on the bacteria in and on the vegetables that came from good soil and uh, the, in and on us, that we think that they go together. I thought we'd just talk about the difference between preserving and fermenting really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, fermentation is a method of preserving. There are many ways we can preserve food, curing, dehydrating, um, pickling with a vinegar, which is already low pH or high acidity, and then we use heat to make sure that nothing grows in there after that. With fermenting, we're hoping for growth and life, and that life inside it will be the preserving agent. So Sharon, can you explain to the viewers where the acidity actually comes from? Lactic acid bacteria. Great. Yes. <laughs> and um, I brought a few here. So today we're doing the Jerusalem artichokes, and this one's two months old. The liquid's gone a little bit foggy, and uh, this will happen and people, it doesn't happen if you're using a vinegar or a pasteurised method. Yeah? This one on the other hand is six months old. You'll see the liquid is still pretty clear uh, and it's been pasteurised. This is your... These are vine just leaves. The, just the vine leaves. Yeah, okay. to make dolmatis. Yum. Yum. Yeah. All right, so let's get going. Okay. We're going to chop Should this cabbage. Well, we can um, chop a cabbage. Okay. It's the whole job. Thing? Well, I think we need to. Okay. I think we're going to put it in a jar. So. You've got to get yourself a really beautiful tight cabbage because we, we're trying to get the water from within the cabbage. And if you get something, for example, you go to a supermarket, it's been chopped in half and glad wrapped, there won't be a lot of moisture left in it. Mm. So fresh is best. You can, wherever you go, even if it's a supermarket, you can ask them to go out and get you one from the back and they always do have them. So, so do that. It's quite important in wild fermenting that we have pretty fresh vegetables. People often ask me if they can, um, give me vegetables that are going off quite mouldy and soft and if we can save them. And we can do that with um, other methods, but when you're wild fermenting, you're really trying to capture the vegetable in its current state. So if I get a mouldy, soft vegetable, I can bring life back to it, but it's not going to be the same product as if I got a very, very fresh cabbage and preserved that freshness. Like I said earlier, there are uh, three or four things that are, they're all easy things, but each one's quite important. And one, when it comes to cabbage, doing a great job, Kelly, because we really want them to be similar to in cooking. You want them to be around about the same size because they're going to ferment at the same time. If you had big chunks in there and then, and then thin pieces, could create an uneven ferment. So step one, make sure you're cutting them evenly. And then you're going to need to weigh it. There's no good weighing the whole cabbage first and saying, oh, I've got two kilos of cabbage because after you've taken the heart out and the outer leaves, it will weigh different. So once you've got your quantity, weigh that and work out what is between 1.5 and 2.5% salt. So you don't have to be too exact, but you certainly don't want to go over that because it will stunt the ferment. It'll be too salty. Nothing will happen. If you go under that, you will get a soggy failed ferment. We really need the salt. Uh, salt is so important in fermentation. And then we're going to put that salt in and massage it. Now, if you don't need anything other than your hands, hands are all we need here. And just remember that we've been fermenting things in the most rudimentary 
kitchens without tools, without scales uh, for a very long time. So this is not high tech. Don't let not having a thing like a jar or an airlock put you off um, fermenting. Just, you don't need much. So as I massage this, it seems like we have a lot, but it's going to shrink right down and it'll become juicy. And we're gonna massage this until when I pick it up, the juices are flowing. Most of us now know that, that um, this is really good for your gut health, but I think that people often get confused um, with the difference between prebiotics and probiotics. Yes. Do you want to just talk a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, do you know what? I don't like talking about these things in the way of probiotics and prebiotics. If the bacteria is happily living on this cabbage, it's full of prebiotics. So prebiotics are what feed bacteria. So if you have a gut and you're, you're eating non-fibrous foods and a pretty, pretty average diet, um, you might not have anything in your gut to feed the bacteria. So if you're taking a capsule of probiotics, yeah. It'll just go through and it'll perhaps dissipate and not really function very well. When you're getting your bacteria naturally like this, this is a prebiotic. It That's is right. fibre. The bacteria right. exists happily on these foods. Um, and it's not just cabbage. A, a really good natural beer or um, any other fermented uh, foods that you come across, they are prebiotic and probiotic. Mm. But the words sort of change the, take the beauty out of it a little bit, I think. Yeah, and also I think it's important to remember that those capsules are just monocultures, really, yes. aren't they? And this is a polyculture, which is what's so beautiful about it. That's right. So and also so good for you. That's right. And that's delicious. It. Super delicious. And I mean, just people are, um, ask me, you know, I buy all your products, but I don't know how to eat them. Um, and it's like just, it's a condiment. It's not your main course. So whatever, whenever you're eating something a little bit fatty, that is when you should have an acid. And that will help you to digest the fats and it helps your body um, to get the most out of the nutrition, that's mm. the, whatever else you're eating. Now you probably can't see it from there, but this is now starting to get really beautiful and shiny. Um, the water beautiful. is starting to, to come out of the, the red cabbage. You really need to keep going so that when you squeeze it, juices flow. And if you find that that's not happening, you just have to keep going. Sharon, a lot of people worry about whether or not they have to sterilize their jars. Is this like jam making or can you, is it just enough to have a clean jar? It's enough to have a very clean jar. You know, you don't want to just pull one out that's a little dusty or anything. Yep. Very hot water or a dishwasher is fine. Okay. Yeah, it is not like jam making. Because in, in um, pasteurizing or heating things up as we do in jam, we're heating it up to make sure nothing grows on there. This is our little farm. We want it to be a friendly environment for things to grow, mm. Mm, which can scare people a little bit, but it's just remember what I said earlier. It's like we've been doing this for a very, very long time. Longer than we have been heating things, that's for sure. Mm. And I think farming is a really great metaphor to think about what's happening in the jar yeah. as, the, as the ferment is progressing, is that we're, yeah. we're feeding the microbes, the microbes are feeding each other because there's a whole bunch of microbial communities living together at once and each is living off the waste of the other. Yeah. Um, and, and that's where we get the beautiful acidity from, uh, from the, the ferment, waste. is yeah. the waste of the, uh, of the microbes and that's what helps preserve um, the vegetables, but really it's a it's a kind of an agricultural practice in a jar. So you can see now, I'm getting there, but there's still not a lot of juice coming out just yet. So we'll keep going because we need the juice to cover the top of the cabbage. Yeah. So that's really important that the vegetables are completely submerged in, yeah. the, in the liquid. So Otherwise you end up with a little bit of mold on top, which you definitely that's don't it. want. And which, yeah, that's right. So when we talk about the right environment, it's a no oxygen environment. Do you want to talk a little bit about temperature and why this is such a great time of year to be doing oh, ferment? Yeah. Well, I mean, think about what we're trying to do in fermentation is not just make something more digestible and more delicious, um, you know, and enhance the product. We are preserving abundance. So whatever's in season and abundant, we want to save for when there isn't abundance, which would be early spring, right, for example. Um, cabbages are great. They keep really well, but towards winter, You'll have a lot of cabbages and you'll need a way to make them, keep them. So uh, traditionally, fermentation is in a cool temperature. Mm -hmm. So but people think it should be hot, but actually it's a cooler this is the perfect is better. I'd here. say low and slow is best for fermenting. So we're up in Dalesford and we're in a, we keep our, our, all our krauts below 18 degrees, so between 12 and 18, because they get time to develop slowly. So the cabbage is ready, it's beautiful and shiny and juicy. 
uh, at about this stage. Just before it's really juicy, I add the, the spices. And in this case, um, I've got some beautiful orange peel. I'll put orange peel because it tastes delicious. Mm -hmm. um, and fennel seed. Orange and fennel are such a great combination. Yeah, right? So the general rule, you, you tend to want to put a lot of stuff in your krauts. But um, if you just say you've put a tablespoon of salt, then probably half of that in herbs. Okay. Because the cabbage is going to shrink, but the herbs and spices don't. And we, we are, we're aiming for delicious. And you'll just be overwhelmed with fennel seed flavor or orange peel flavor. Yeah. So I'll let this sit. So you don't have to keep watching me massage. And let's talk for a little bit about brine veg. Yes, okay. Right, so in a brine Brining. veg, brining. So you know pickles. Um, these days, you'll buy pickles on the shelf in the supermarket. If anything like this is on a shelf, it's indicative of pasteurisation. So it's been heated up so it can be on a shelf for 10 years, which is super handy to have food on your shelf. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to fermenting, we want that life in the jar. We're preserving not just the pickle, but we're growing life. And, and that, when you bite into a real pickle like this, and it fizzes and uh, is lively, this actually feels good, but also when it goes into your gut, a good Five minutes later, you're like, oh, I want another one, mm. right? Because your gut's like, oh, I'll have more of that. Yeah. Um, there's a big difference, but you can do this pickling, and I don't know what happened, but humans these days we seem to love pickles, right? There's there are not a lot of other things that we grab. You can do this brining with cauliflower, beans, Jerusalem artichokes, um, onions, anything that you like, carrots. You can preserve yeah. them in a, a live brine, and the good thing about it is that. It can be ready within about five days. It's much faster than sauerkraut. Mm -hmm. I've chosen Jerusalem artichokes because as I open this, you can smell not mm. gassy, gassy yeah, smell. Yeah. It smells yeah. like beautiful garlic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Take off the weight. You see the um, brine is a little slimy. viscous. Yep. When that happens, um, you can let it sit for longer and it'll eventually go away. It'll sort itself okay. out. Slice that off a little bit. Now when you do them, I, I, sometimes I slice them up really fine and put them in the jar. And other times when I'm too busy, I just chop them like this because I'm not sure how I'm going to use them. Maybe I'll roast them. Because they're fruity, uh, we wouldn't roast them necessarily because you're just going to get this quite acidic flavour. Mm, yeah. But if you were to only ferment them for five to ten days, they wouldn't be this fruity and sour. This is more like eating a pickle. It's quite delicious. You said this was two months old? At least, yeah. So um, there you go. Now this okay. is just Jerusalem artichoke, 3% three to 5% salt in a brine, which is we're going to make in here. So a brine is simply salted water. And funnily, it's the same um, saltiness as the ocean. Okay. Isn't well, we all nice? know what that tastes like. Yeah, you know what that tastes like, and that's what you're aiming for. You could just go to the ocean, grab a bucket of water, and um, boil that up and use that as a brine. Maybe not at Altona Beach, though. No, maybe not downtown. <laughs> the first time I ever made pickled vegetables, I used a vinegar. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't oh. know about any of this stuff. And it was awful. It was so sharp and uh, you don't get any of the beautiful complexity of the vegetable or any of the flavours that yeah, come, come through, through the, the, the microbes. No. So. so this tastes as though it's covered in vinegar to our, our you know, it feels sour it and you can't believe you're like, how can it be? When you do this with carrots and beans too, people are always like, how can that be? What, there isn't any vinegar in there? It's like, no, that's lactic acid bacteria. How do you think vinegar's made anyway? That's right. Yeah. All right, so just, let's just chunk these up. What do you think? Yep. Now these have been scrubbed quite a bit. We don't want uh, dirt in our brine, that's for sure. And um, what do you think will go well? I think maybe a chili. So we're going to add a little bit of flavour to our brine as well. That's what makes it more interesting. It's as simple as chucking a few things in a jar. Mm -hmm. You'll see I've put a chili in, a couple of little bay leaves, a little bit of garlic, mm -hmm. and now I just pop them in the jar. Okay. This is, this is really, really simple, isn't it? Yeah. So like I said, carrot sticks or carrot rounds, beans, which we'll do in a minute. So should I really just cram these in? Yeah, cram them in, and I'm going to make the brine. Here's my water. We spoke about water and the ocean, um, the salinity being the same as the ocean. This is 15 mils and this is a litre of water. So I'm going to do, I need 30 mils, I need 3%. I wanted to leave a little bit of space at the top. Did, did you want to put a yes, weight on top yes, of this? Yes, we do. So, okay, so generally when we're doing, and as we pack the kraut, you'll notice, we leave a, a thing called headroom, mm -hmm. which is just about that much because there's going to be some gas action, yeah. which we'll want to push it up to the top of the jar. 
Now you'll notice we're not even going to use a litre because it, there's no room for a litre. So, but in order to get my salt quantity right, I always measure about a litre and that way we, we can... Um, so they will... Um, this is probably too, too, too full, but whatever. So airlocks, when you do get an airlock, if you are going to use one, you need to fill it up with water. It looks really sciencey. It's pretty simple. We're just trying to make sure no air can get in, but gases can get out. Mm -hmm. If you don't have one of these, then you're just going to need to release, burp your jar. If you've got a nice big jar, we'll just open and close. Yeah, it's which fine. is fun. Yeah. Now you don't want to put this in a sunny spot like direct UV. We're not against light. A lot of people think that you have to keep everything in a dark space. You don't really. But what we don't want is like three hours of really hard mm. sunlight and then cold again. We want to keep, we want to nurture it. So it'd be nice if it was similar temperature for the whole time. That's not going to happen in a house, in a, particularly in Australia. We're not that well insulated, are we? Um, so put it somewhere like in the cupboard or in the laundry where it's going to just stay and be about the same temperature. And in about five days, I might check it. I might take the lid off and have a little taste of one. You'll be able to see how many gases, if you go like that, will start going up and you'll be tempted to do that. And there's nothing wrong with doing that with clean hands. Just go in. I think we should now do the sauerkraut. Okay. All right, I think this is ready, Kelly. It looks ready. Let's have a look. Oh, how beautiful. Yeah, that's, that's enough. That's enough from this cabbage, I think. Yeah. So there's juice there, and we're going to push it down really hard in the jar. So first up, we want a clean jar. Mm -hmm. So it's really important now to make sure to pack it really tight. We don't want any air in there. A lot of people I've seen just throwing it in. That's, no, we need to get it as tight as you can. That's air it. is the enemy. It is. Look at that beautiful Look at juice. The, oh. So we're just going to put a little cabbage leaf over the top. Do you want to pour some of that liquid in there or do you think there's enough? Yeah, we, well, I think, have we got any liquid? I think I might put this in another little jar okay. and we'll need that liquid, so. All right, so I'm just going to, oh, look at this perfect leaf. Let's pop that there. And grab a weight. So we're just putting water in here again, you see? Yeah. To keep the air out and give it a way to get out. It looks magnificent. So minimum two weeks, mm -hmm. I, I recommend. At about three weeks, the vitamin C levels start to increase, which is okay. amazing. Vitamin U. Vitamin U? Yes. Who's even it's heard a real of that? thing. Cabbage has a lot of that. Um, and then you could, you could go for six, eight weeks longer. Um, if you forget about it, don't worry about that. Should we do some beans as well? Let's do some beans. So should All we right. get rid of this? Do yes. we need this? Put it to the side. So all you're going to do is have, make sure you've got your clean beans. Some people top and tail, I just leave them. If they're really beautiful fresh beans, you don't need to worry. So shove all those in. Okay. I'm going to do, I call these dilly beans because actually it tastes like dill pickles. Right. And you just snack on them, like take them on a car trip. Take the whole jar in the car and eat them one by one. In front of a movie, that kind of thing. They are delicious on a cheese board. And if you make them on a Monday, they'll be ready on a Friday. So quick. Yeah. These are really fast. There must be a lot of sugar in these, eh? The more sugar in something, the faster. Yeah, I mean, they don't taste sugary, but no. they must. Chili in. Did I put garlic in already? No. Just one. Is it, is it too much to cut this? No, you do what you like. I'm just going to just roll this up and put it on the top of the beans, like that, and pour the brine over. The brine is just 30 grams of salt to one litre of water, which is two tablespoons of salt. You know, because this is a short ferment, you don't really have to worry as much about having an airlock. Um, you just need to gas it for a couple of days and then it'll be ready. So this is like probably the, the entry point ferment really, beans, carrots, cauliflower. And that way also, if you're doing cauliflower, for example, that goes with curry spices really good. I see I've got some curry leaves here. If we had cauliflower, mm -hmm. curry leaves, coriander, garlic, turmeric, yep. ginger, delicious. Beautiful. All right, so again, we just put the lid on, put the lid on to this and let it sit for five days and we're done. All right, well, I hope you've uh, got a little bit more of understanding about wild fermentation, how easy it is, mm -hmm. how accessible it is. Mm -hmm. um, the byproducts of fermentation are easy, easy to use. I've made crackers earlier with sauerkraut juice and the leftover rice from sake making. Mm -hmm. They're all in crackers. It doesn't end at what's in the jar. The possibilities yeah. are endless.
So hopefully we've broken down the mystery of wild fermentation a little bit. It's uh, made it more accessible. Thanks for having me here. Thank you so much for coming, Sharon. It's so uh, wonderful for you to be able to share your wisdom with us and to tell us a little bit more about the microbial communities and the, um, all the wonderful things that you can do with vegetables and microbes together. Anytime. So, thank you, Sharon. Thank you.